Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're very lucky to be joined by Jessica Flahout, uh, and uh, she's uh, come across to us from uh, from uh, Amsterdam, where she's uh, currently doing a postdoc. Jessica uh, did uh, her PhD and finished uh, in November 2011 uh, in uh, at the Geology Laboratory at uh, Lyon, and uh, her supervisor was Kathy Quanton. Uh, she then did a uh, first postdoc at the University of Paris uh, Sud in Orsay uh, with the uh, Omega uh, team and then uh, has uh, gone to the Free University in Amsterdam where she's with the Faculty of Earth and Life Sciences uh, for a second postdoc. And uh, Jessica was the uh, recipient of the Van Strelen, uh, Ge uh French Geology uh, Society Prize. Um, and her uh, interests so far have been re mainly related to uh, lunar and uh, Martian studies, remote sensing of uh, Mars and the Moon. She's studied uh, such topics as constraining the habitability of Mars through multi-component analysis of sulfate-rich deposits. Uh, and she's recently published a couple of papers on uh, uh, Valles Marineris, which we're going to hear a lot about um, in her talk today. Uh, one uh, is on dikes of distinct composition in the Noachian lower parts of the Valles Marineris, uh, the origin of sulfates in Capri Chasma, and um, morphology and uh, geology of those sites. And uh, she's also uh, published on uh, lunar land uh, science, uh, science sites, science related landing sites. Um, so uh, please join me in uh, welcoming Jessica. <laughs> Thank you, Adrian, and thank you, everybody, for uh, coming today and watching us online. I'm very happy to be here, not only because this is actually sunniest and warmest than Amsterdam at the time, but also because I enjoy uh, talking a lot about my favorite area of Mars, which is uh, Valles Marineris. So before I start, I need to confess that I'm not the only one that is uh, fascinated by this very big canyon. And I need to acknowledge the work of my um, collaborators that are listed on, on this slide. And uh, especially my uh, former PhD advisor, Cathy Quentin, um, who is um, really addicted to digging into the canyon and really um, gave me the passion of, of working on Mars. So before I take you on a guided tour of, of the canyon, let's talk a little bit about Mars in general. So we all know that Mars is the fourth planet in the solar system. Just like Earth, it's a terrestrial planet, it's a rocky planet that is differentiated in a core, a mantle, and a crust, which is the outermost shell of the planet. And Mars also possesses an atmosphere, but it's much thinner than on Earth. And it's also, um, it also has a very different composition, mostly made of uh, carbon dioxide. Because of this difference in size, uh, in atmosphere um, size and composition, and its uh, further distance to the sun, uh, the conditions at the surface of Mars are really different than at the surface of Earth. And the temperature on average is a lot colder, uh, approximately minus 63 degrees Celsius in average, but it can go down to like minus 130 degrees or so. The pressure at the surface of Mars is also really low, about um, six, six ecto ectopascal. Um, if we report the, this value of surface uh, temperature and pressure in a phase diagram for water, we can immediately see that liquid water is not stable at the surface of Mars in the current condition. So if you look at this plot down here on the slide, where you can see this um, blue line represents the three um, states of, of water um, and where water is supposed to be stable according to the pressure and the temperature. Mars conditions are represented by this red box. So in average, the pressure is way too low and the temperature as well to have liquid water on Mars in the current condition, under the current condition nowadays. If we take a closer look at what Mars surface looks like, well, we can see a lot of different things. So here I've displayed two maps. The first one is um, a map of the topography, the elevations at the surface of Mars, obtained by the Mars Orbiter 
laser altimeter. And the map um, at the bottom is the age distribution of the terrains on Mars, which are obtained from a crater count. The more uh, surface is craterized, the older it is. So we can see that we have quite some um, heterogeneity at the surface of Mars. And the most struggling thing when we look at this map is this dichotomy between the thousand hemisphere, which is made of high elevation plateaus, which are highly characterized and are, are uh, characteristic of the Noachian period, which is the oldest eras on <coughs> Mars that spanned probably from 4.5 to approximately 3.7 billion years ago. So we call them typically the southern islands, and they are very old terrains. And on the contrary, the northern hemisphere of Mars is dominated by these lowlands, these quite smooth plains, which are mostly Esperian in age, so they were formed sometime between 3.7 and 3 billion years ago. There are a few areas of the surface that are younger, that we call uh, typically Amazonian terrains, so younger than 3 billion years ago. Of course, the polar caps, north and, and south, at high elevation, and also the two big volcanic provinces of Tarsis and Elysium. So all this um, diversity of, of terrain ages and uh, types on Mars shows us that the planet has been geologically active, and it might still be active. We, we don't know for sure. And the planetary processes that are responsible for the formation and the subsequent evolution of Mars should be expressed somehow through the diversity of the rocks exposed at the surface. And that's why I decided to study the composition of the Martian surface. So by looking really at different types of rocks we can find there, we hope to learn about how they were formed and what the, where the processes at play, whether they are magmatic or sedimentary processes. So we have different types of informations on Mars available to learn about the, the composition of the planet, especially the composition of the surface, because it's, it's a bit tough to look uh, deep down inside. So one of the first source of information we get is um, the SNC meteorites. There are meteorites that we think that they come from Mars, and that we find here on Earth. So we can analyze their composition, of course. The problem is that they are small samples, and uh, we don't know exactly where they come from on Mars, where they were ejected from. And they also, most of the time, encounter some alteration um, when they, they just fell on Earth and, and stayed there for a while. So another source of information is, is the measurements that um, can do the rovers and the landers that we uh, sent uh, to Mars. They can do some measuring situs where, where they landed. And we have some data from the Viking missions uh, from this. Uh, 60s and 70s, but also from more recent rovers, uh, the Sojourner rover, rover on board Pathfinder, the Mars Exploration rovers, of course, Opportunity and Spirit, uh, the Phoenix Lander, and more recently, the, the Curiosity rover, which is part of the Mars Science Laboratory mission. The only thing is that these rovers, they bring us information about a specific location at the surface of Mars. They, they tell us what they see around their landing site or, or where they can move, which is, I think, the, the further distance we have traveled so far is a little over 30 kilometers done by opportunity. So that's not much variation. You know, it's, it's a small range of data. So in order to get more global information, really, about what the composition of the surface of Mars is, the most important data sets that we use are remote sensing observations that are taken by the instrument on board the, the spacecraft that are orbiting Mars and that provide a more global coverage. <coughs> we, use, uh, uh, we use specifically, specifically some um, uh, instruments that are called spectrometer and that, of course, give us information about the mineralogy of the surface, so the composition. So one of the things we have seen really um, early with this spectrometer is that the, the surface of Mars is covered in dust. Um, ferric oxides are actually um, typi the typical minerals that we find in dust. It's, it's rust, basically. 
so if we look at the, the map of the ferric oxides as, as we found them on Mars, we realize that they are very abundant in the northern hemisphere. And they are actually, so it means that these lowlands in the north are covered in dust. And actually, where there is dust, we cannot see the composition of the rocks below. So we have very few information on the real composition of this northern plain because of this dust coverage. But fortunately, dust is not like very uh, thick everywhere on Mars. And it looks like there is a lot less dust in the thousand hemisphere. So in this area that we call a spectral window, because we have information uh, uh, where we don't have the dust, we can look at the composition of the rocks. And most commonly, we will find some mafic minerals. So they are just silicate-rich minerals that contain magnesium or iron. And they are just the most common, common rock-forming minerals. Um, typically, we find pyroxene or olivine. That's, that's the mineral you can find in any volcanic rocks, really. So globally, the composition of Mars is what we call basaltic. So basalt is a, is a common volcanic rock. Nothing surprising. It's a bit like the, the ocean floor on Earth. But still, we made quite some interesting detection uh, after 2003, thanks to the Omega spectrometer on, on board the Mars Express mission. It was a spectrometer designed to study the, the absorption of, of the surface in the visible near infrared. And this domain is really nice to, to look for hydrogen minerals, because that's the domain where you will see the absorptions for, for the water molecule. And Omega has shown that we uh, detect quite frequently, even th if they are not everywhere, some hydrogen minerals at the surface of Mars. So hydrogen minerals are just minerals that contain uh, water molecules in their structure. So they, they require liquid water to form. And we find different types of, of hydrogen minerals. Phyllosilicates, or clays, are commonly observed in, in the Noachian terrains of the Thousand Islands. Um, they are small outcrops, so they probably uh, correspond to some local environments, but we find them at many locations. On the contrary, we also detect sulfates, which are um, sulf sulfur salts. But they are, their distribution is much more limited, and they are associated with layer deposits always, which are uh, characterized sedimentary, a sedimentary media for the deposition uh, in Esperian terrains. So they were formed uh, probably a little after the, the clays. Uh, sometimes we observe also that these, these hydrogen mineral detections are correlated with some nice um, also geomorphological indication that there was um, probably liquid water, just like here I've displayed an example of some clays detection, detection correlated with, with uh, an alluvian uh, fan. So these tell us that there was water on Mars. But we already knew that, right? Actually, since the mariner missions, we know that there must have been liquid water at the surface of Mars in the past. Um, during the, the, since the 80s, we have been studying a lot these, these um, valley networks that we can observe at the surface of Mars. Uh, that characterize some, show that the water has must have been flowing at the surface at, at the moment. And these valley networks are specifically observed in the old Noachian terrains. They are mapped here in, in red on this uh, global elevation map of Mars. But they are not the only feature that is um, showing that there was water. We also find some evidence for water outflows uh, in Esperian terrains, but evidence that are more limited. We call them the outflow channels. That's the case of, of uh, two valleys that I've, I've shown here. So outflow channels are also um, channels that were carved by water, but they are not branching out just like valley networks. And uh, they are just um, very narrow but deep channels. And we think they were formed by like uh, uh, very intense but short-term flows of water. So there was also water probably during the experience, but more limited in, in time and, and in amount. So all of these observations led uh, to the questions of whether there could have been some sort of uh, climate change on Mars. This transition between um, clear rich mineralogy in, in Noachian terrains uh, to, to sulfate rich mineralogy clearly shows that there was a difference in in the chemistry of the surface, probably um, uh, sometime at the end of the Noachian, 
Clays typically form under a warm, in a warm and wet environment. Uh, to form sulfates, you also need liquid water, but you need more acidic conditions. So there was probably something that happened, and I could explain that they are distributed really in, in terms of different ages. And also there is, of course, this decrease in, in water-related features that we observe at the surface that really <coughs> suggests that, that the surface was maybe warmer and wetter before and it became suddenly dry and we don't know exactly <coughs> why. So the idea is what, that there might have been a climate change on Mars, uh, probably starting at the end of the Noachian, even though we, we don't really know why it happened and how it worked. And that's one, this, this problem of, of Mars pla past climate, of course, has strong influence on the, the past habit habitability of the, of the planet. And that's currently one of the most outstanding questions that we have about Mars is, is what, what was the climate like and, and if Mars could have been habitable at the beginning and if there could still be evidence right now for, for this past life or eventually present life, if life could have survived. So I decided to look into these um, questions and specifically at this transition between you know, these clays and sulfate minerals and, and these water-related morphologies in a specific area of Mars, which is called Valles Marineris. So why did I decide to pick Valles Marineris? Well, there are many reasons. Um, Valles Marineris is this uh, huge canyon system that you see close to the equator of Mars. It's about 4,000 kilometers uh, long and 10 kilometers deep. So not only is it really impressive for geologists when you look at it, but we actually think it opened at the beginning of the Esperian because of the... Um, as, a, as an answer, really, of the crust to the load of the Tarsis volcano, so all this uh, uh, reddish area that you see is a big high elevation dome that it contains the highest volcanoes on Mars, including o Olympus Mons. And this has probably put some big load on the crust. And the, 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 the answer of this crust would have been to crack by extension in its upper part. So that's what forms a rift. So we think Valles Marineris is, is a rift and was formed from this cracking of the crust. And it was formed in the Esperian, but then it's cutting through older terrains. So it's cutting through Noachian terrains. So in, in the walls of the canyons, you can see up to 10 kilometers of terrains that, that are, were older than were Noachian. So there is quite a unique geologic record that is exposed here. And Valles Marineris has been known, of course, um, uh, since minor uh, nine, because it's, it's just very impressive. It's actually the largest fault in the solar system. So 4,000 kilometers long is about the distance between like France and Canada. And the depth, 10 kilometers, is, is an average five times the, the maximum depth of the Grand Canyon in the US. So five times deeper than the Grand Canyon. Actually, if we displayed Valles Marineris on the map of the US, it would run completely from the East Coast to the West Coast. It's a really, really huge canyon. And that's also why we have divided it into several sub-canyons that we call chiasma, or chiasmata in the plural form, for, for like um, easier identification of the different areas. So um, the canyon has been studied a lot uh, in the past. But of course, every time we have new data, we, we just get new information and higher resolution images. So there is always a lot of work to do there, you will see. And um, people have found multiple evidence for past water activity uh, run up through the canyon, but also we will see that there are huge sedimentary deposits within the canyon as well. And there have also been a lot of detections of hydrated minerals in the area, which also make it lo uh, really interesting to look at. So what I've been doing uh, in my research was to just um, compile all of the remote sensing data available on Valles Marineris and look at them. And I've used um, data from former missions um, as kind of a background information, but I focused a lot more on the new data that were available, especially the data from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter mission. The, the data be, um, were released just when I started my PhD, so it was really a good time for me to, to look at them. And um, there are two nice instruments on board this, uh, this orbiter, which are the iRISE camera. We can take image 
which can take image of the surface at a resolution of 25 centimeters per pixel. So it means that we can distinguish objects of that size at the surface of Mars. So I said 25 centimeters. That's really impressive. And also, I looked a lot at the um, CRISM data, which are, um, which are um, spectral imager data, so give us information about the mineralogy. And uh, they have a resolution which is about 20 meters per pixel, so it's a bit lower. And since, since these data are really high resolution, of course, they are just really, really big, so a bit hard to manage. So for that, we used a um, giant numerical database that are called Geographic Information System, where we can just display all of our, our data together. So that's a couple of, of pictures that were taken actually by iRISE, this fantastic camera I was, I was telling you about. We actually have taken thousands of images at, of the surface of Mars at this resolution from a distance that is um, at best 300 kilometers actually. So that's really quite impressive. And lots of these data we haven't had the time to even look at right now. And they, they just so, show fantastic things. Um, since 2005, we have been able to observe stuff moving at the surface of Mars thanks to these, these cameras. So um, that's really, really neat. And the other instruments I've been using a lot is the, the CRISM spectrometer. So it's a, it's a push-boom spectral imager. So basically what it does, it's going to look at the light that is reflected by a portion of the surface of Mars. And depending on the composition of this portion of the surface, certain wavelengths are going to be absorbed Others are going to be more reflected. So that really depends on, on the minerals that are present. So the, the signature that we're going to get is going to be different depending on what's in there. And each mineral has a spectrum that is characteristic by its global shape and its set of absorptions. So by just looking at the spectrum that we get from the CRISM instruments, uh, we can just identify the minerals that are present at the surface of Mars. So what the instruments do is just collecting the light that is reflected from the surface, sending it to a prism, and that's uh, decomposing the light in its different wavelength. And you, you get um, a reflectance spectra that you can uh, just analyze. So um, what we do is we try to identify minerals based on their absorptions. And there are two main types of absorption. I will go really quickly over that. Uh, the minerals that contain iron usually uh, get very wide absorption in their spectrum, as shown here on the left, right, maybe for you. Um, that are due to the electronic transition of the uh, iron uh, 2 plus uh, ion. Uh, there is also another way to get absorption in the spectra. It's because of the vibration of, of the molecules, and, um, and usually these cr create very narrow absorption. In a, in a reflectant spectrum. And we are particularly interested in, in the vibration of the water molecule, which we can observe in the infrared. So all of the minerals that actually contain H2O are going to have a very narrow absorption at 1.9 mi micron. So by just looking at whatever is absorbed at 1.9 micron, you can already tell if you have hydrogen minerals on Mars. And then you can look at other absorptions to see, um, to see what exactly what type of minerals you are looking at. For instance, if you're lo looking at clays, you will have absorptions between 2.2 and 2.3 microns, depending on the exact composition of those clays. So if it's an iron hydroxide bond, it's going to be at a, sh a different position than a, an aluminum hydroxide. So you can get really precise information on the composition of your minerals with that method. So what we do is that we get our spectra collected by CRISM, and we compare them <coughs> with um, Lots of references of, of known minerals, what, what the spectra are for known minerals that we commonly find on Earth. And we just try to match the sets of absorptions. So if we see, for instance, here the example shows a very nice um, absorption at 2.1 microns. If we look at the, uh, the minerals that we can find in the spectral library, where it matches very well the magnesium sulfate, kieserite. So that's how we identify minerals <coughs> on Mars. So because it's really boring to look at some spectra, I'm going to try to show the less spectra as possible. And a nice way we can overcome that is that we can just um, map the minerals in nature that we see. So it's more visual, and it actually helps us see where we, we find these, these the minerals like visually on, a, on, a, on an image. So what we do is usually we just um, 
create band depth map at a given wavelength. Like if we want to look for hydrogen minerals, we're just going to map the absorption at 1.9 microns. And then we can see exactly where our, our, our detections appear, for instance, on a coupled uh, eye rise image. So um, now let's go with something a bit more exciting. I'm actually going to show you some real image of uh, Valles Marineris. And I've especially looked at three different places around the canyon. So I didn't put them in a chronological order. I actually started out with, with the way I, I just did my research, because I started with what seemed the most impressive, which are these sedimentary deposits in the middle of the canyon. And then I started looking around and figuring other things that, that that look nice in the walls and on the plateaus, so I will mention them quickly. But let's start with, with what they, we call the interior layer deposits of Valles Marineris. So um, very early uh, in the 80s, we identified some uh, layer deposits in the center par central part of most of Valles Marineris Canyon. You can see on that uh, HRSD image, that's very impressive deposits. They are a few kilometers thick up to, I think, uh, seven or eight kilometers of deposits. So that's the size of Mount Everest on Earth. And they usually have a flat top. Um, they show some fine layering, uh, which indicates probably a, a deposition in a dynamic media, so a sedimentary context, context. We don't know exactly what their origin and age uh, is. Some people say that they, are, they were older than the canyon and they were exhumed during the opening. For other people, it's some just infilling that, that just came after the opening of the canyon. Uh, we just know that, that they imply probably some, somehow some, some water um, in their formation. And actually, about their origin, there have just been so many hypotheses since the 80s. And even now, we cannot say exactly where, how they were formed. Some people argue for lacustrine deposits, so lake that were just completely filling in Valles Marineris. Uh, other things that we're actually looking at sub-ice volcanoes. Um, for other people, it's probably just a pile of, of aeolian, of volcanic deposits, or, or maybe spring deposits. And that's still unclear as of today. That's uh, what they look like, actually, with the uh, HLS image. At this scale, you cannot see the, um, the layering, but that's the, the ILDs in uh, Ophir Chiasma. And that's these very smooth mounds that you can see in the in the foreground, and sometimes they are just as high as the wall as of the canyons. What we know since 2004, since the uh, Mars Express mission, mission, is that these ILDs are enriched in hydrated sulfates. So we know that they are associated with the, the sulfate that we observe on Mars. And what I've been doing then uh, was trying to look at uh, part of the canyon, because that's, that's definitely huge, that's a lot of data trying to figure out if we could learn more about the, the age or the origin of these deposits or even their composition. So I looked at Capri Chiasma with, with the new, newly available data. So Capri Chiasma is this small ca uh, canyon at the outlet of Valles Marineris. And it contains uh, three big piles of layer deposits. The, the main one is about 200 by 100 kilometers uh, wide and let's say about four kilometers thick. And then you can see two outliers, actually, to the first. And what is really nice is that in between these um, different mesas, we can see some line streaks. We can see some, like, something that came and carved the deposits and carved the, the, the bottom of the canyon. So we have evidence that these deposits were actually eroded by water outflows after they were emplaced. If we actually look in detail at Capricasma, there are a lot more evidence for water activity in the area. So um, at the outlet of the canyons, we can see some terraces in the walls that were also carved probably by multiple water outflows and that are aligned with these uh, line streaks that, that cut through the canyon. The canyon floor itself is actually a quite characteristic of, of a fluid-rich area. It's what we call the chaotic floor. It's just an, uh, uh, lots of, of small kilometer scale mounds. So it's a very rough topography, and we think that formed um, because of the collapse of a um, volatile-rich uh, floor. So maybe there was some ice or, or something in, in the 
So while I was in the basement of the canyon, and then it just went away, and, and it collapsed, and it formed this chaotic basement. We also observe um, sometimes some uh, very nice alluvian fans in the walls. And here I've put an example of a fan that even has a small feeding valley ca carved in the plateau. So definitely there has been a lot of water flowing in there. And that's quite interesting because I told you Valles Marineris was open 3.5 billion years ago. So we think at that time probably the planet should have already been quite dry. But we have here evidence, a lot of evidence for water outflows. So that's just a, a way to map them in order to make them a bit more obvious. But I'm um, not going to detail that. So first thing I did was, was looking at 3D models um, to check the, the relationship between the chaotic floor, which is this, this um, small mounds that we see, and the layer deposits. Um, on this image, we can see clearly everywhere there is a blue arrow that the layer deposits are overlapping the chaotic floor. They are clearly direct on this chaotic floor. They are not affected by, they don't have any chaotic mounds on the top of them, but on the contrary, they, they just cover this chaotic mound. <coughs> and that's very important because that proves that they were just deposited after the formation of the chaotic floor. So after the opening of the canyon. So I think this is a good argument to say that the, these layer deposits are younger than the canyon opening. So they were formed after the opening of Valles Marinette after 3.5 billion years. Uh, we can also try to um, age the current topography um, by doing some crater counts. So um, the crater counts actually, uh, they don't really align because they show very complex history in the area. But they give us an estimate of, of the age of the current setting, you know, the current topography, the last big uh, modifications. They tell us that there was probably some outflows cleaning the floor until about 2 billion years ago which is really late in Mars history. And they also tell us that the ILDs are probably about 3.5 billion years old, because there are some large impact craters on the top of these ILDs. But then they have been ero eroded until 2 billion years ago. So the idea is that they are younger than the canyon op opening, but they probably formed really quickly after the opening of the canyon, or maybe <coughs> even uh, during, and they could have helped, actually. Uh, the graben um, formation and, and uh, the extension. So looking at their <coughs> composition really quickly with CRISM, which uh, uh, has a higher resolution than the, the previous instruments that we used Omega, we confirmed that we found some sulfates uh, associated with these layer deposits, so hydrogen minerals. But we also observed two different types of sulfates. Uh, some of them are called monohydrated, because they have only one molecule of water in their structure. Others are called polyhydrated because they have uh, several molecules of water. And we especially noticed that the polyhydrated sulfates are commonly found at high elevation and, and very low elevation. And the monohydrated sulfates constitute really the bulk of the deposits like uh, at, at mid elevation. And that's, that's really hard to explain this kind of stratigraphy, but that, that tells us about changing changes during the, the formation of, of these deposits. So that was for Capricasma, but of course Valles Marineris is a, is a lot much wider than that. So let's look at what <coughs> others have found in other areas of the canyon. Uh, first example is, is in Juventa e Chiasma, it's uh, the work of, of Janice Bishop. And uh, she has looked at, at some uh, small ILDs mounds also in the canyon. Also, she also found some sulfate signature in association with these deposits, and typically monohydrated sulfates, but sometimes polyhydrated sulfates also at high elevation. Uh, we tend to observe the same stratigraphy in, in other canyons, Kendor Kiasma, Genghis Kiasma. So it seems there seems to be a trend that, that at the time we are not sure how to explain. But what we can tell from the analysis of these layer deposits definitively is that there was a strong past water activity in Valles Marineris until at least two billion years ago in, in Capricasma, the outlet. That the layer deposit seems younger than the, can, uh, the canyon opening. This uh, stratigraphy that we see in the sulfates could suggest some changes in, in the environment of formation or in the source material for, for these deposits, but we still don't know exactly how they form. But at least they tell us that, that these deposits formed probably in, in multiple episodes. The sulfates, we also don't know actually 
uh, what's their origin, they could be evaporites. You know, when you, you just evaporate a brine uh, and you just precipitate some, some, some salts, it's very common on Earth in, in desert, for instance. But they could also form from the weathering of pre-existing, eventually sulfur-bearing material by, by acidic water. And we also don't know exactly what the water source was for these deposits. If we had standing lakes or if it was more punctual outflows, maybe in relationship to, to the volcanism of the Tarsis volcano that are uh, located just to, to the west. So there are lots of still lots of in uncertainties about these deposits. So the next step to learn a bit more about these deposits was I figured we should look at whatever is around those deposits and we should make sure we don't find them again in the walls of the canyon. You know, this, this, just this sketch that is crossed because I'm arguing that they are younger than the canyon opposite, so I really need to make sure they are not present in the walls and they are not like exhumed deposits. So I started looking at the walls of Valles Marina. He's trying to figure out if I could find more sulfates. And what I found there was actually really unexpected, but it's, it's a different story. So let's look quickly at what we found in the walls. So that's also an HHC um, stereo camera image that uh, allows us to do 3D images. Uh, showing you the walls of Valles Marinaris. They have this very typical um, morphology pattern that we call spurs and gullies, which is, um, we explain it through a combination of, of um, extensive tectonic and erosion. And uh, so what we see is that they have this typical pattern. It, they are very dusty. Uh, it's very complicated to get good signature, uh, mineral signature there. But in some places, rocks outcrops. That's that's especially the case in the upper part of the walls where we see these very nice horiz dark horizontal layers. And then when we uh, go deeper, we don't see layers anymore really, but we tend to see some dark boulders. And at the very, very bottom of the walls, so 10 kilometers deep down, we actually observe some very strange, bright, massive rocks that are, are really fractures. And bright rocks are not that common on Mars because we tend to to see more uh, often volcanic rocks. So looking at, at the, their composition with chrism, we have actually um, detected some uh, iron-rich uh, clays in the middle of the walls and uh, some um, low calcium pyroxene, which is a, a really typical type of pyroxene in the bottom walls. And there is just one linear detection of olivine, and uh, I will uh, come back to it in a few minutes, because um, since this detection seems to follow really um, a special distribution, I will try to argue that, that it's a dike that we are looking at. So just quickly, this detection, wh why do they, what do they correlate with? Well, if we just um, display our chrism map on the top of the high-rise image of the walls, we see that the iron-rich clay that we detect are correlated with this very dark boulder that we see in the middle of the walls. And these pyroxenes in nature are correlated with these bright rocks that we see at the bottom walls. If we look in more detail at the composition, actually, we see that the, the bottom walls, the rocks, have a very, very extreme composition. We think it's n uh, about 80% low calcium pyroxene, which is a lot more extreme that, than any common lava on, on Mars. So I would like to explain to you maybe why uh, later. But I'm insisting on this picture because for someone that, that commonly works on Mars, it's really striking to have iron uh, uh, clays bearing materials that are very dark, like these boulders, and on the contrary, mafic rich rocks like uh, the low calcium pyroxene detections, they are very bright rocks. Because usually when we see bright rocks on Mars, they are just sedimentary deposits, hydrogen minerals, salt, but not, not a composition made of mafic minerals. So it was a really hard idea to, 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 to show at conferences and to convince people that here the I mean, it's the data, but the bright rocks really are, are some mafic rocks, volcanic rocks. So coming back to that olivine detection that is here mapped in, in red, if we actually look at the, um, the uh, coupled high rise image for this detection, we actually see some sort of a linear pattern. And, and if we zoom up, we see that there seems to be something intruded really in, in the rock, and that forms this really linear uh, thing. And there is kind of like a, a um, kind of a border of crystallization, you know, like a metamorphism thing at the, at the border between the two of them. 
And we observe those uh, linear features commonly on, on Earth in volcanic areas. We call them dikes. It's, it's just a volcanic vent, really. It's, a, it's just a vertical vent. It's like a wall of, of just magma that was at ascending sometime through a fracture, and that's why it, it's just so vertical. And so we have just um, probably find some, some very nice dikes in Valles Marineris, and they actually uh, correlate very well with the, the fault network of, of the Graben, and that might have implications for the, the formation and the deepening of, of the canyon. So if we, I'll just go back to, to this... Um, this cross-section that we made through the wall, so we have this, this um, pyroxene-enriched ba basement that is really enriched in this low calcium pyroxene, that is capped by a, a layer made of dark boulders and rich in clays. The upper part of the wall is just a stack of lavas, you know, it's mm. just a, a pile of horizontal um, lavas. And sometimes the bedrock is intruded by this olive-enriched stack. <coughs> this is something I first observed in Capri Chiasma. And then I, I just started mapping it everywhere in Valles Marineris, and I realized we find the same observations everywhere in the eastern part of Valles Marineris. It's always the same stratigraphy. But strangely, I was not able to detect any of those low calcium pyroxene or, or phyllos leakets to, to the west, to the west of Valles Marineris. And I figured, okay, maybe I don't have enough um, data coverage there. Maybe there is too much dirt, so I was too unlucky. But I mean, that's a lot of. of of too, too much. So um, my PhD advisor actually did a complementary study and she decided to look at the, the crater uh, central peaks around Valles Marineris. So whenever there is an impact for the large crater, there is usually an uplift of, of um, deeper material in the central part of the crater forming a central peak. So in, in the, really in this peak of the crater, you get samples of, of what's going on in the subsurface. So she has been looking at all the craters that were large enough to have a central peak around Valles Marineris, looking at the composition of this peak that tells us what is actually below the surface, um, in the shallow subsurface. And she looked at the eastern and western craters, and she found really different patterns. In the eastern part, all of the craters have these very bright, fracture, massive rocks in their central peak. But in the western part, they show a stack of very fine scale layers, dark layers, all of them. And, and the limit is, is about the same I, I was finding in the walls where I couldn't see any more this, this bedrock on the observation. And uh, you can look, if, if you want to look at the paper, you can see many more data of, of these images of Central Peak. And it's really systematic that to the west and to the east were very different materials. So we came up with the idea that there is probably some kind of a a border, a dichotomy in Valles Marineris between the east and the west, and they are cut in two different materials. So uh, if I summarize our observations, basically we have this, this bright basement that has a very specific composition, very enriched in low calcium pyroxenes. That's actually the composition of, of the crust, uh, the lower crust of the moon. But that's uh, also the composition of, of one specific Martian meteorites, uh, ALH. 84001, which is uh, made of 98% uh, of, of low calcium pyroxene. And it seems that these rocks may occur in, in, at more locations on Mars, especially in the central peaks of very large craters. So our interpretation was to say that these rocks that have a very strange composition and aspects are probably some cumulate rocks that formed in depth and are the remnants of Mars primary crust. So really the crust that would have been inherited from the differentiation of the planets. That could be exposed here uh, in a unique way because Valles Marinis is just so deep and has this huge record. And here, uh, preserved in their geological context. And these outcrops are capped by these uh, clay rich dark boulders, which we think could, could just represent some uh, alteration layer or the alteration of, of the upper part of this crust uh, through the impact um, um, by the impact gardening that was quite important at the beginning of the history of the planet. So about the, this um, dichotomy, the fact that this uh, stratigraphy, we only observe it uh, in the eastern part of Valles Marineris. Well, we think there is, it implies that there is a large scale tectonic structure within Valles Marineris. We don't know exactly if it's, if it's like a thrust fault, if it's um, a basin structure that could uh, exist in the west. Remember that to the west there are the Tarsis volcanoes, 
So it could just be that in the West we have just been accumulating a lot more materials from the volcanoes, lavas and ashes. And so it's just we have a, this big pile of volcanoes and, and the crust is, is way deeper than what we can see in Valles Marineris. So that's, that's it for our conclusion on the walls. And, and that's quite some recent work. So I'm looking forward to hear about what, what other will have to say. Um, now, um, very, very quick. I have only a few slides. The last thing we looked at was the upper part of these walls, which actually um, and what we can see around the canyon, uh, which constitute the plateaus of Valles Marineris. And when looking at Capri Gasma, of course, I quickly identified that there was some sort of a bright uh, formation overlying the, the plateaus at the uh, first uh, west of the canyon. If we look at uh, the high rise image, we can see that there are some sort of brightish deposits. If we look at their composition with chrism, well, we uh, see typical absorption of clays, but we see two types of clays. We see iron magnesium rich clays at the bottom, and then we see a thinner layer of aluminum rich phyllosilicates or clays that, that just overlap these iron rich phyllosilicates in the upper walls. And the total amount of, of clays, it's about, um, the layer is about uh, 150 meters thick, and the distribution is just huge. We found these clays systematically where we have a chrism observation over an area that is, that is greater than, than 900,000 kilometer squares. So they are just clays all over the plateaus uh, in Eastern Valles Marineris, really. And, the, and they, sometimes we see them in the walls uh, as the very, very topmost layer of, of the cross section. And I wanted to, to mention them because, well, they, remind, uh, they reminded me of, of a very uh, well-known area of, of Mars, which is called Mars Valleys. It has been uh, really um, well studied at, as it was one of the uh, potential final landing sites for MSL. And in this area, we also see this succession of, of iron-rich and aluminum-rich clays, aluminum-rich being, uh, clays being on the top, over an area that is greater than, than 10,000 kilometers squares. So the idea is that is there a common mechanism that is responsible for, for the formation of these two deposits? But the thing is that they are like, several thousand kilometers apart from each other, Mars Valleys and Valles Marineris. So then if, 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 it, if it's a common process that formed them, then maybe it's, it was related to some sort of global scale climatic condition. And so far, what we think is that probably these clays were formed by the alteration of volcanic material. The other way to form clays would be to precipitate them from a, from a lake or from, from a standing body of water. But since we are on the plateaus of Valles Marineris, there is not a very nice topographic setting for, for standing water there. So obviously, maybe we, it was more likely that we just did some, some weathering of, of um, lava flows. So in the presence of water, uh, possibly precipitation, running water, we, we don't know. But uh, we think that this uh, typical evolution from iron-rich uh, clays to aluminum-rich clays could indicate a, a change in the composition of, of the lavas that are weathered or maybe an evolution of the environmental condition. And usually, um, aluminum-rich clays for formed with more water or in a more open system than uh, iron-rich one. So more intense weathering. Or they could also reflect pedogenesis processes that actually form this typical profile on, on Earth uh, where in, in areas of, of intense rain. So anyway, what we know is that they imply the presence of water when they formed at the end of the Noachian and that the widespread distribution should have some implication uh, on, on the presence of these aqueous environments and on the climate, past climate, on a global scale. So if we just uh, gather all of in these informations about Valles Marineris, we can attempt to propose some sort of a geologic history. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do here. So I think... Um, well, we first obviously had the formation of, of Mars crust that was altered um, in, into clays, uh, at least in its uh, most superficial part, most likely but uh, under uh, the presence of, of liquid water. And that would have happened early in, in the Noachian. So though we assume that maybe it was under a warmer and wetter environment. And eventually, uh, uh, later, some... Uh, Volcanic vents came to intrude 
this crust, and, and they could have been the uh, feeding uh, vent for the volcanic, uh, for th they could have created just a, a pathway for lava, for magma to ascend to the surface and then spread and form this uh, stack of layered rocks that we see in the upper walls of Valles Marimeris. So the story would have been uh, obviously probably different for the west and the east, assuming that maybe in the west there is some kind of a, of a basin or, or maybe s more accumulation of materials coming from, um, from the Darcy's volcanoes. So I'm going to keep fo focusing on, on what happened to the east. And after the formation of, of these uh, volcanic rocks, we started to open the canyon, so by extension. And as the canyon was opening, probably there were some sediments already filling in, filling in the void. And uh, the actually, the infilling could have just created some, some helped the subsidence, you know, the deepening of the canyon. So the fact that this um, central block was, was going deeper. And we see a lot of, so of normal faults that are parallel to, to the, the canyon that are oriented east-west because we're, we're in an extensive contest. And later on, these uh, sediments were likely eroded, and uh, that's why we now have these sort of central piles a bit everywhere in the canyon uh, by water outflows, so which means that there was water again after uh, the formation of these sediments. And, and water has also carved the glasses and deposited some fans that we can see on the walls. So the opening would have happened in during the Hesperian 3.5 billion years ago. The deposition of the uh, sedimentary deposits probably around the same time. And then the outflow uh, erosion would have lasted until something like 2 billion years ago, which is really, really recent again. So if we just go back to that chronology I, I showed you before, well, we can see that actually we have quite an extensive record, which is very impressive in Valles Marines, because we have we have what could be the, the most, um, the oldest rocks on Mars with these crustal outcrops in the walls. But we also have, have uh, evidence for like outflows until quite recently. So we have also very young stuff that happened in, in the canyon. And we could have recorded this, this climate change, this potential climate change since we have the, these clays and sulfates both present in, in this area. So we have quite a unique record there. So I'm asking you then, why don't we just land in Valles Marineris? <laughs> it's so amazing. Well, I think it's a question for the engineers, actually, not for me. We actually tend to forget that we, don't, we have not explored so uh, much of Mars surface. There are many places that we cannot access, just like Valles Marineris. And that could just bring us so much more information about what happened, about the formation of the planet, about its evolution, very... Um, uh, like past, e past evolution, past seven, but also very recent event. And Valles Marineris has so much potential because it has this unique, also water history, uh, and it, it, it still had water when, when most of the planet was supposedly dry, so there were things going on until very recently, and I'm sure there are still stuff going on there. I'm sure it's still moving, and, and there are very nice things to see. And so if I can just leave you with, with one piece of advice, it's just to keep exploring. Thank you for your attention. Jessica, I, um, let me start off with the questions. Um, so uh, the, the dikes that you, um, that you were mentioning, uh, that you saw going into the Noachian, uh, their uh, only identifying characteristic is the olivine, um, Mineralogically, that's all you can see in the dikes. Is that is that true? From, from a mineralogical point of view, the only thing we can detect is, is olivine. So we don't know if it means that it's it's. I mean, it might not be pure olivine. It it might be because um, uh, it's it's really hard to assess from the spectroscopy uh, to be quantifying. It can be a um, basalt that contains uh, contain large olivine grains, and then they would they would have a very a strong spectral signature. Or it can just be uh, um, like a rock that is made of mostly of olivine. Did you see any um, evidence for any halos, any alteration halos around the dikes at all? No, but um, we are limited with the resolution. The dikes are about 40 meters wide, so you can see them very well with eye rise, but wi with chrism it's only two pixels. So even if, if there were some like typical minerals from metamorphism or, or alteration, 
I don't think at the chrism scale you would see them because it would be the signature would be smaller than, than the chrism pixel. But uh, with iris, you can see some sort of a metamorphism border. I mean, there, there is this kind of, of contact, weird contact between the dike and, and the, the rock that is intruded. But mm -hmm. we don't have enough resolution to, mm -hmm. to see with chrism. Thank you. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, the first has to do with reflection spectroscopy. I'm wondering how uh, how much of an influence the, the variation in phase angle has on the uh, observed spectra, uh, and would that confound your mineralogy? Uh, the other question is, uh, do you ever give talks at the planet at the uh, Mars Society? Uh, I'm going to start with the second question. No, I never gave a talk for the Mars Society. Um, I mean, I'm open to any talks, of course. <laughs> Uh, first question, of course, it has a strong influence. Uh, there are actually many, many things that, that have influence on, on the spectra. And that's why we, at the time, we try to be only qualitative and not quantitative. There is, of, of course, the phase angle, but there is also the fact that um, we don't know uh, so much about mixtures, the effect of mixtures. Uh, there, are, there are just the, so the condition of observations, the condition of the surface, the type of mixtures. All of that will have an influence on the spectra. The grain size as well, that's what I was saying, that we don't know if we're looking at uh, something that has large olivine grains, but is not completely made of olivine, or if we're just looking at, at an olivine-rich rock. Um, and also, we are looking through the Mars atmosphere. So um, we have actually to collect all of the spectra for the contribution of the gas present in the atmosphere. Because what we get with prism is a signal of, of the composition of the surface, but also of the atmosphere. So we try to, to modelize the composition of the atmosphere and remove it. But there are definitely lots of things that can influence the spectral signature. And, and that's why we, we are trying to be very careful and just qualitative on, on the interpretations. Hello. Hi. So uh, since we're at SETI, the air of optimism always affects me. So I'm going to say in, say in 10 or 20 years, you're writing a grant proposal for a manned mission to Valles Marinaris. Uh, what would be like your top goals? What could astronauts learn just walking around? Or how, how deep would they have to dig to either confirm or, or modify your history that you showed us at the end, uh, your proposed history? Well, I think they would, they could do definitely a lot more, like in situ, than, than we can do with just remote sensing images. And, and I think that could be just so valuable to have a geologist going there. And he would probably have a lot of fun with, with this big pile of, of rocks. Um, of course, that would be interesting to look into the hydrated minerals. That's what what's everybody is so focused on right now. But I think one of the most valuable things would be lo to look at this, these rocks that we think that are just so extreme in composition and we think could be the, the remnant of the crust. And there could be a lot more analysis that we can, because what we can say is that, well, from a spectroscopic remote point of view, we think that there is 80% of orthopioxin. But maybe by just looking at the rocks, they will realize it's not true. Because there are also some minerals that are mute. We cannot see them uh, in the infrared. Um, uh, with reflectance spectroscopy, like um, plagioclase. And they could constitute maybe 80% of, of the rocks. So by just first characterizing these rocks um, visually, and then analyzing the composition, isotop an uh, analyzing eventually isotopic composition, so that we can get also an H. Don't know if they are really like uh, those, uh, this pristine. And then looking uh, on the field, I mean, uh, at the alteration of these rocks. Um, looking at the sedimentary deposits, I mean, that I, can, I can only think about a hundred places where they could just land and, and see something exciting, but, but there are places where they could definitively look at, at, I would go at the bottom of the canyon for sure, look at whatever is, is deep there, so the, the, the oldest rocks, the sedimentary deposits, and then just look up at the cross section, you know, and if you can even, even climb and, and sample along the way, that would be amazing. That's probably a lot too risky. Hi, Jessica. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more about the ILDs that you observe. And you mentioned several of the chasma as well as the main Valles Marineris. Can you comment on the differences or similarities you see in the ILDs or the, the sulfate mounds? Is, 
do you see, you, you mentioned during your talk about differences from the west to the east. Do you see any differences in the types of ILDs or um, anything you want to comment on the similarities or differences? Well, there? that's something we started to, to look at. Um, in terms of composition, we tend to see always kind of like this stem uh, stratigraphy with the monohydrated sulfate at the base and the polyhydrated of, of the bottom. But in terms of aspects, they, they tend to be a little bit thinner to the, to the east in Capri and Ganges, which are the easternmost canyon. They are only three, four kilometers thick. And in the central part of Valles Mariner is in, in Kendor and, and Ophir. You have at least seven kilometers, I think, of, of deposits. And they, theme, they seem to also have thinner layers, but sometimes the layers are also harder to see to the east, which is, which is a bit, um, so they, it seems that, that the layers are thinner, but we don't see them all the time to the, to the east, actually. But maybe that's also because um, there is a richer history of outflow activity there, and maybe a different erosion pattern. Yeah, I have an outsider question, but I have always been interested to know what the current meaning is about the any activity still, seismic, tectonic activity that w would be detectable on Mars. Because I read that some of the slopes being moving in recent years would indicate maybe some movement of the ground. Is that something well, that you... We hope that, that there is actually still some movement going on because we're going to send a mission uh, called INSIGHT, uh, I think end of, of next year, which is um, going to be um, to do geophysics and there's going to be a seismometer to do measurements of, of the seismic waves on, on, the, on Mars. And for that you need a source, you need a seismic source. So we hope that the, the impact but also uh, possible tectonic movements would, would um, produce some, some signal for the, for the spectrometer that we're sending. I think, I think there is still some small, at least tectonic movement in, in, in Valles Marineris, but there, there is always at least uh, some slumping, some av avalanches that, that were um, monitored actually by the high-rise cameras. So we, we can see avalanches, we can see newly formed craters. It's, it's hard on our time scale to see really the movement if there is some stuff going on, on um, in the fault. But I think some people are working on that and, and they're thinking it's still moving, probably not so much. But there, there are, I think I, I rise is one of the best tools to see that there are things moving on Mars, definitively. Okay, Jessica, we have a, um, a special uh, mm. SETI Institute, uh, SETI Talks mug for you. Thank you very um, much. Please join me in thanking Jessica for her <laughs> great talk. Thank you. <laughs>